Hello and welcome to the Physics of Fun Vehicles of Saints Row. My name is Dave Bianchi and I'm a system designer here at Volition. Most recently I acted as a lead system designer on Saints Row 4. But I've been working at Volition for over nine years now, spanning seven games in-house including the entire Saints Row series. I was also the only vehicle designer in the studio for Red Faction Armageddon, Saints Row the Third, and Saints Row 4. It's also worth mentioning that I come from a computer science background, a fact which I find leads me towards technically demanding systems like vehicles. Also, fair warning, there is a bit of math ahead. To give you an idea of where the concepts of this talk came from, I came onto SR3 pretty late on the project, about six months before submission. At that time, vehicle handling hadn't even really started. In fact, not a single vehicle could be considered first pass complete. And there was an absolute mountain of work ahead. SR3 featured over 90 vehicles, each of which needed unique handling. The majority of those were cars, which are actually the most complicated, but there were also motorcycles, tanks, boats, planes, helicopters, and VTOLs, which are basically a helicopter and a plane in one, so each one of those needs two sets of handling. Now this talk is about the things I learned during that time, so I'm going to be talking a lot about vehicles today, which is a topic you may or may not work on personally. But these lessons have far wider design applications, especially when working on systems that are technically complex, contain lots of assets, or are related to player traversal. In fact, nearly every concept in this talk was effectively used in the design of the super movement seen in Saints Row 4. Throughout this talk, we'll go through the four main aspects of working on complicated systems like vehicles. Understanding what we're working with, reducing external dependencies to keep us from avoidable rework, taking on the bulk of the work itself, and utilizing feedback to strengthen the design. The cornerstone of being able to work quickly on something like vehicles is to come to really understand how they work. How hard could it be, right? Well, it turns out it was the most technically demanding system I've ever worked on. And I'm no slouch, I've worked on some doozies like Red Faction's Destruction. Like so many games, Saints Row uses the Havoc physics engine. Working in Havoc is a many splendored thing, but it's simulation engine at heart which means it's generally quite complicated to work in. Havoc vehicles are no exception. Between the various Havoc properties and those specific to SR3, a single one of our vehicles can have over 350 variables. Here's a peek at what the handling properties look like for a vehicle from Saints Row. As you can see, it's a big enough file that PowerPoint doesn't even like it, and that's after it's been optimized. And that's just one of several tables that affect a given vehicle. But having so many variables isn't entirely foreign. For instance, there can be hundreds of variables for a single weapon, too. The even bigger problem is how interdependent these variables can be. For instance, something as simple as how fast a car turns is affected by over 25 variables, including wheel friction, yaw torque factor, inertia shape, viscosity friction, I could go on. And with all those variables, you'd think you'd have everything you could possibly want. But some of the most important variables aren't defined as you would think. For instance, within the hundreds of variables, not one is acceleration. Now how could it be that with all those properties, something so basic isn't available? So obviously there's quite a bit to learn about here. We've all done plenty of online research, I'm sure. But the problem is most of the, what you find on vehicles is fairly useless. Too often you'll find racing enthusiasts that talk about specific real-world ways to tune cars, like this. 4.56 is a good gear ratio for drag racing. Now findings like these are less than helpful, as they don't get you any closer to understanding why that is a good ratio, or what changing that value means to the handling of the vehicle. If you've never gone there before, HowStuffWorks.com is a great source for all kinds of technical information, as they actually break down the how and why of it all, and present information in easy to understand formats.
While it certainly doesn't cover everything you need to know about vehicles, it does have a nice section on gear ratios that's relatively easy to digest. The best research I've been able to find is a website by a couple of guys at Stanford who began researching the physics of cars to better decide on a new car to buy. Now this site has lots of real world equations on the physics of cars that you can really sink your teeth into. But the problem is these guys are also super nerds, so it can take quite a bit to translate everything they're saying into something you can readily use. And I think a lot of designers would be afraid of taking on that task, so I thought it'd be useful to give an example of taking something complex and making it easier to work with. Here's our sample equation found on the site. I think most would find this guy pretty daunting. So we need to change this into something we're more comfortable working with. Something like this. Here's an equation I would guess most system designers or even just players are well aware of and are comfortable using. Damage per second is equal to the damage per hit divided by the time between those hits. So how do we get there? Well, this isn't school, and what we're interested in isn't so much a correct answer, but rather how various parts of the engine affect each other. This allows us to take some liberties with the equation. For instance, this middle section is about rolling resistance. Resistance is never a primary factor in motion, and we're not really interested in this value right now, so let's just consider it constant and remove it. Similarly, the last section here is about air resistance and drag. Again, we're talking a fraction of the total force, and we're not interested in that at the moment, so let's remove that one too. We can always come back and try to understand this section later. And how many of us think about anything in Newtons, in force? I'd much rather look at something like acceleration. Thinking back to high school physics, F equals MA, so let's make that conversion. And we can get the F out. High school math comes in again. Algebra says we can move that mass to the other side of the equation by multiplying both sides by 1 over the mass. Now we're getting pretty close, but I would guess many are intimidated by the symbols we still have here. It still looks pretty mathy, what with the subscripts and Greek letters. So let's just replace all those symbols with what they mean using our legend here. And finally we have something that's downright usable. And again, what we're looking for here is how these values interact with each other, which you can tell by what side of the fraction something sits on. So we know that increasing gear ratio will increase acceleration because gear ratio is on the top of the equation. We also know that increasing mass will decrease acceleration because mass is on the bottom. This begins to tell us how to deal with changes. For instance, if we're making a special monster truck variant of a vehicle that has twice the tire radius, we can compensate by doubling the differential ratio in order to come out with the same acceleration. It's science. The end result looks a whole lot like our DPS formula. Remember that as far as understanding how to use it, this equation is really no different than the acceleration formula. If you wanted to increase your DPS, you could either increase your damage per hit, since damage is on the top, or decrease the time between those hits, because time is on the bottom. So in the end, this is exactly the same level of complexity, even though this formula looked more complex. And of course, if you're really not comfortable doing this kind of work, I'd wager there's a friendly neighborhood programmer near you who'd be happy to display their mathematical prowess and help you out. So in time you'll come to an understanding of cars, but they're complicated and there are a lot of them, and just understanding the properties isn't where things end, because changes that others make can easily create a need for rework. When working with lots of assets, that type of inefficiency can be the death of good systems, so we need to reduce the effects of outside sources. When you're working within a simulation engine, even if you aren't going for a simulation feel, Every part of a vehicle affects the handling as they do in real life. Some of these, the shape of the vehicle, its wheelbase, its center of mass, are dependent on the asset rather than design-driven variables. Now likely you already intuitively know this to a degree. Which do you think would be more agile, 
this huge armored car or this tiny little smart car? Here's one that might not be as immediately obvious. The elongated slender shape of this limo means that it's going to turn like a boat and that it'll be one of the most difficult vehicles to make feel good. But for the most part, I, su I suggest that you embrace these truths instead of trying to work against them. Working against the nature of a vehicle adds a good amount of work and ultimately may not be very successful. More importantly, working with the shape of your vehicle lends an authenticity to its handling and helps to uphold your player's expectations. How would it feel if you jumped into this limo and it turned on a dime and acceleration, it accelerated like a supercar? It wouldn't feel very much like driving a limo. The real problem here shows its head in iteration. This dependency on the asset can easily lead to a situation where artists can't freely iterate on their work, as changing the shape, even slightly, might mess up the handling of the vehicle. Take this example from Saints Row 4. The collision on this UFO, shown in blue, doesn't take into account the wings, leading to significant clipping. Now this is clearly a bug, but fixing it is going to change the shape of the vehicle's collision, which if left unchecked would lead to significant changes in how the vehicle handles. A change like this could even lead to needing a completely new handling pass. And that's assuming you're even aware that a change occurred since this would be addressed by a vehicle artist, not a vehicle designer. Now that's obviously not very efficient, and when you're working with lots of assets, you won't have time to redo one every time there's a bug. The solution to this issue is to separate the physical shape of the vehicle from its handling by lying to Havoc, our physics engine. Havoc was already accepting center of mass point defined in the model. To make it less dependent on the asset, we simply created a designer defined offset from the model center of mass point. That allowed, us, and that allowed design to move the center of mass as needed without editing the model. To separate the shape from the handling, we basically create a fake box that represents the inertia shape, the physical shape of the vehicle as far as the simulation is concerned. Looking at this example car, the yellow box is essentially what Havoc thinks the shape of the vehicle is. Because this is defined independently and by a designer, changes from artists are less likely to affect the handling of the vehicle. And when setting up this box, you can still follow the basic shape of the vehicle, maintaining that authenticity while still defending yourself from future changes. Now that makes us less dependent on the asset, but the separation will never be full. We also need to agree on a couple of rules to ensure our artists aren't affecting the handling in other ways. For instance, artists try not to make drastic changes to the shape of a vehicle, including moving the wheels, which can still mess up handling. And every once in a while, something does come along that necessitates a change here, but it's on the order of one or two vehicles per game, rather than all 90 vehicles every time there's a bug. And since these steps allowed for more control for design, they also resulted in some unexpected benefits. Now I love to see that, as in my experience, making the right move will often lead to unexpected benefits, whereas moving in the wrong direction often results in unexpected negative consequences. Since design could essentially define the shape of the vehicle, we can now do things like lie and say that small vehicles like this motorcycle are much larger than they actually are. You can see that the yellow box in this picture is telling Havoc that the motorcycle is several times its actual size. This helps to stabilize these small vehicles so that their handling isn't quite so twitchy and so that when they get into an accident with a much larger vehicle, they aren't thrown around like they were nothing. This also helped to better transfer handling properties from one vehicle to another, since the exact shape of the vehicle wasn't as dominant on its handling. This came in handy when working on future vehicles like those from DLC or Saints Row 4, as we can very quickly get basic handling on a new vehicle based on the values from an old vehicle that we want the new one to handle like. So at this point we have a good knowledge base of how cars handle, but it's all academic, and that can only get you so far. What we don't have is context, we don't have the feel, and it, at the end of the day that feeling is all that matters.
What you need to get to is this. A car that still has feeling, it still has character, but with a deep enough understanding to execute and iterate on it. Before you can really seek into the meat of the work though, you need to define the vision, the style. This definition can remain high level for now. As you build up your comfort level and learn about your system, the picture will become clearer. In the case of Saints Row 3, we had a game-wide style goal of exaggeral, creating something larger than life, over the top, but generally not outside the bounds of possibility. But what does that mean for vehicles? This led to the following goals for our vehicle gameplay. We wanted to create a weightier feel, something that felt more grounded with a greater differentiation between the way the cars felt. We wanted to make more room for skill to come into play than in previous games. As always, we wanted to continue pushing on the sense of speed, which I'll go into later. But along with all of these goals, we needed to remain easy to pick up and play, and in many areas we needed to get better in this regard. Saints Row is a mainstream game with vehicles representing a significant amount of playtime. Players of various skill level needed to find our vehicles palatable. And with the high level vision defined, it's time to begin defining individual vision for a specific asset. This may be different from what you're used to. It's quite nuanced. Most of the time when de design decision, uh, de okay, I'm gonna restart that one. This may be different than what you're used to. It's quite nuanced. Most of the time, a design vision exists in broad strokes. It's about interactions of game mechanics. The vision for how a car handles, along with the player camera and controls work, is all about feeling. How does it feel to drive that car? Now, this process is pretty hard to talk about because in all honesty, I can't really put into words exactly what I want a vehicle to feel like. It's all up in my head. But just because it's hard to put into words doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Try this. Take a look at this vehicle, the Enfuego. Gut reaction. Imagine how you think you, sh you should feel to drive this vehicle. This is the beginning of that vision. Now try to delve deeper into it. Break it apart. How would this car accelerate? How would it turn? How does it react to the resistance of moving a thumbstick? How would it drift around a corner? You just created the beginning of a vision of feel. It'll grow deeper in time as you work to get, your know get to know your car better. It'll also mature as you work on other assets in the game, as you become more aware of what you can do, how you do it, and how this piece fits into the larger whole. Finally, it's time to begin working on turning the vision into reality. When working with a huge number of assets, it can be difficult to know where to begin. They say with writing it's best to just start doing it, that as you begin to write, it'll spur other ideas and things will begin to flow, and you can always go back and redo that beginning. I think this theory is very applicable to design work as well. Which isn't to say some places aren't better than others to start. When starting with systems you aren't familiar with, it's helpful to begin with an asset that gives you some of that familiarity. Since we're looking for accomplishing a feeling, selecting an asset whose feeling you're more aware of can help the process along. I would imagine that this Cosmos fits that bill for many people here. It's your typical no-frills coupe. Another good option is to start with an asset you would consider the average or common case. You won't always have the luxury of being familiar with the work at hand. This Cosmos fits that bill as well, making it a particularly good asset to start with. Defining your common case first can help inform work on uncommon cases later whereas the opposite isn't always true. What you don't want to do is start with something like this. This vehicle is called the Pulse, and, well, it's pretty weird. Its shape and three-wheel design means it's going to handle differently than any other four-wheeled vehicle or two-wheeled motorcycle. And that's great, because a vehicle like this is all but assured its own unique character when it comes to handling. But if this were the first vehicle you ever worked on, much less of the work would be transferable to other cases. 
Now, whichever asset you begin with, as with most design work, never expect to call your first pass done. More important than nailing it the first time is the learning that will come along with the process. As you move on to other assets, you'll surely learn more and become more adept at the work. And just like the first line in the written work, you can always come back later. Now with our basic vision defined, now begins what could be a lengthy journey of experimentation with our new system. The first thing I like to do when a programmer gives me a new variable is to ask for information on it. On top of a description, it can be informative to ask what the expected range is. Test out the variable at the extents of that range. These pictures will show how moving the center of mass up and down on a vehicle can affect how much the body of the vehicle rolls around when turning. Note how changing the values affects the feel. See here, at the bottom of our expected range, we don't get much body roll at all, which ends up making the vehicle feel pretty stiff. All right, I then like to break out outside of those suggested ranges and try a very high value. Don't be afraid to go five or 10 times higher than the expected maximum. Sometimes the expected values don't end up being the right ones, but more than that, going outside the normal bounds can sometimes give you a better idea of exactly what's going on with the variables by accentuating its effect. This is especially true if you're working with an effect that's subtle or difficult to isolate. All right, well, lesson learned. It looks like if our center mass is too high, the vehicle is just likely to flip over. All right, let's try an extremely low value. All right, another lesson. If center of mass is below the vehicle itself, the body will roll the wrong direction in a turn. Here's what a comparison of the proper roll direction. All right, use these initial test values together to give you your bearings so that you can take an educated guess at a good value in between. Then go up or down as necessary in progressively smaller increments as you come to closer to what seems like a good value. And don't worry about finding the absolute perfect value. You're still experimenting and there are many more variables to work with, so getting somewhere in the ballpark is fine for now. Note that if you end up landing on a value that's outside the expected ranges, it's generally a good idea to mention that to the programmer you're working with to make sure it's kosher to use that variable like that. If it creates a problem, work with them to find alternate means of accomplishing your newfound goal. During this experimentation phase, your goal should be to build up an intuition for how changing variables changes the feeling and how all the variables interact with each other. For any given problem, there are often several paths to a solution, and a big part of building intuition with vehicles is in knowing the right way to solve that problem. As mentioned before, over 25 variables affect how a vehicle turns, with varying degrees of effect. And since everything is interconnected, changing any one of them will most likely result in differences in some other part of the vehicle's handling. Developing your intuition can help you avoid changing things the wrong way and build awareness of the secondary effects of your change so that you can go and compensate for them. You're also going to want to watch out for the big players. These are your variables that have a greater effect on your behavior than others. These are going to be your go-to variables, the first place you go when you want to change the way something feels. Get to know these guys really well because you'll be using them a lot. A great example of a big player variable for vehicles is mass. Changing your mass changes pretty much every aspect of a vehicle's handling. Its acceleration, its turning, its suspension, how it behaves in a collision. In fact, it's so integral to the behavior of the vehicle, mass ends up being the alpha variable, the one you want to set early and be aware of any changes in the future or else you may find yourself needing to perform an extensive new handling pass. A very important note when we're working on iterating feeling, getting instant feedback for changes is absolutely paramount. Now that's a real product, by the way, over the top instant feedback. It's pretty much Saints Row 3 in a bottle. In Saints Row, for instance, I can hit 
tilde and the V key at any time to refresh all vehicle data. But whether this is re running a refresh on tables, tweaking values through console commands, or fancy live updating, when working on accomplishing a specific field, you're likely working with very subtle changes. So putting time in between testing iterations from having to reload your level or restart your game entirely can mean it's nearly impossible to truly understand what your latest change did to alter how things feel. Now that we've built up a certain level of comfort within the system, it's time to divide and conquer and start applying what we've learned across all of our assets. For assets as complex as vehicles, it's good to break up the work and take it on in smaller chunks, and then tackle that particular aspect across several or even all of your assets in a single pass. This leads to several benefits. By focusing on a single part of the whole, you'll be able to dig deeper into that aspect of the system, and across working on it on multiple assets, you'll learn a great deal about how to best work on that portion of your system. Taking on a smaller chunk can also keep things from becoming overwhelming when working with daunting assets. Maybe you only have to work with 10 variables for this pass instead of all 350. Working in passes can also make it easier to see the differences between your various assets, as you'll move on to the next asset more quickly with previous ones fresh in your mind. Finally, working in passes can help to eliminate human error. When trying to take on a complex asset in its entirety, it's easy to forget about one piece or another. As an example, I almost never brake when I drive in games, so it was easy for me to forget about balancing how a vehicle brakes as I worked on it. But taking on braking behavior as its own pass ensured that every vehicle would get the love and care it deserves. It's a bit more difficult to split up the work into discrete chunks for vehicles because of how interconnected all the variables are. But while general handling can't really be broken into smaller pieces, there are several other parts that can be taken on individually. Here's what those passes could end up being, but of course the exact passes will change from system to system, so my exact list here isn't overly relevant. When working in passes like this, be sure to always revisit the first few assets you hit in a given pass. Inevitably, while running through the pass, you'll be learning along the way, and thus you'll end a pass with a better understanding of a subject than when you began. Revisiting the early ones means they don't get the short end of the stick because you hadn't yet mastered the aspect of your system. A big part of the work with vehicles and lots of other traversal work is accomplishing a feeling of speed. And that can be difficult for any number of reasons within a game. In Saints Row, for example, we had a very hard limit of 100 miles an hour. If the player could move faster than that, he'd be able to drive to new areas faster than we could load the world around him. And, and he would end up in driving into unloaded zones. And just as importantly, while you always want to go fast, the fact of the matter is most players don't have the ability to drive around city streets dodging traffic and taking turns at 100 plus miles an hour. It's just too fast. But that doesn't remove the basic human desire to go fast in a vehicle. The desire is still there, so we should address it as best we can. As with many things in design, luckily perception tends to win out over reality so the solution here is to develop methods that make it seem like you're driving faster than you actually are. Not being able to go much faster than many people drive on the highway forces us to develop a myriad of tricks. Looking at altering perception led to a handful of new opportunities and all were very easy to implement, especially when compared to rewriting an entire world streaming system. Something as simple as keeping the camera close to the ground can make things feel much faster. It also keeps the camera close to the action and makes the player feel a stronger connection with the driving experience. We also added a camera shake that would kick in above a certain speed and become more intense as you approach the maximum speed. Camera shakes make things feel a bit less controlled, which then adds to the player's association of speed.
The effect can be surprisingly palpable. Notice how this GIF infers a certain speed and you can't even see where the car is going or even if it's moving at all. But probably the single most useful trick for altering the sense of speed is your vehicle's field of view, your camera's field of view, or FOV, which alters the perception of depth. Take this shot, which is at a fairly standard FOV of 50. Now compare that to the same scene with a significantly lowered FOV of 20. The player is standing in the exact same spot here, but notice how much closer the building in the distance appears. Lower FOVs squash distances, making everything appear closer. Now let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum. Increasing our FOV to 100. Higher FOVs accentuate distance, making things appear farther away. See how far that building in the distance is now? Since a higher FOV makes distances seem farther than they are, they also make travel feel faster than it is since it feels like you're moving a greater distance over the same time. The effects of shifting FOV are well displayed in a cinematography trick you may recognize called the dolly zoom. Notice how it looks like the depth of the scene is stretching out around the actors. And this is accomplished by drastically increasing the FOV of the camera. Now each of these methods are fairly subtle on their own, but don't underestimate them. Together they can make a pretty big difference. Take this example of the Temptress, one of the fastest vehicles of Saints Row. This shows what it looks like to drive at 100 miles an hour in our city. Not too shabby at all. Now let's see what happens when I'm no longer using those tricks in my favor. Keep in mind this is the same car going at the same speed taking the exact same route. And it feels almost unbearably slow. And these three tricks are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many more things we do to make our cars feel fast, and there are many more still that we have yet to try. Audio can be a particularly strong way to alter the player's perception, for instance, but in Saints Row I can't say we're fully utilizing that fact when it comes to the sense of speed. One last tip before we move on. A tool that I use regularly is to sleep on changes before checking them into source control. In a single day, you're likely to make hundreds of subtle changes and thus play with tons of iterations of the feeling you're working towards. And getting so close means it can, you can become numb as to whether or not what you end up with is actually an improvement. As an example, if a vehicle isn't very good at drifting, after spending so long working on it, I'll unwittingly be accommodating those shortcomings as I'll get used to them. I'll learn to drift how that car drifts even if it isn't proper. It's often quite helpful to hold on to your changes until the next morning and try them again before checking them in. The night helps break you out of knowing the asset too well and allows you to better criticize its handling. In some cases, excuse me. In some cases, you may spend so much time with an asset, you'll need to wait several days before checking it again in order to better break yourself out of knowing it so intimately. But ultimately there's no escaping the simple fact that you're going to be way too close to your system. This happens in every type of design, whether you're working on level layouts or player progression. You're well aware of every aspect of your intention and thus can't be the best judge of how intuitive your design is. Even in the best case, you only represent a single view, and your design likely has to work for millions of players. Which leads us to feedback. Since you'll be getting so close to the problem, you'll need to verify your work through other sources. The first place to look is within your own studio to your fellow teammates. 
A very simple method for internal review that's excellent at reviewing a large quantity of assets is what's often referred to as crank format. Crank format involves regularly getting together with other team members involved in a specific area of the game. Select a group of assets for review with the focus being on quickly creating a list of action items. A goal time frame is set for making the identified changes after which the re group reconvenes to verify the adjustments as well as review the next set of assets. Importantly, all of these reviews should be done through hands-on time by a different member of your team, someone besides you who doesn't know exactly what to expect from a given asset. Note that while doing internal review by other team members on something technical like vehicles, there's usually a certain level of translation that's needed to get from the comments you receive into a list of action items. This is mostly due to lack of common understanding and vocabulary. So be prepared to ask lots of clarifying questions. For example, if another designer provided the feedback here, this car isn't peppy enough, you might ask, do you mean it doesn't accelerate fast enough, or do you mean it isn't agile enough in a turn? Now, I find it helpful to supplement these peer critiques with my own personal reviews. While cranking on assets as a small team, I'll also revert, re review them personally between meetings. This functions as an extension of the sleep on it mentality. By the time an asset comes in in crake review, you probably haven't played with it in a while, so you can make a more accurate assessment than when you were fresh off working on it. These personal reviews are important, as whereas others can provide a new perspective, as a systems expert you may find yourself able to look deeper than others, capable of finding smaller, more subtle issues. Performing your own personal reviews can also help you to translate the feedback you received from your teammates. But of course there's only so much you can get with internal reviews. The problem is everyone working on your game is likely well, of your, well aware of your design's intentions. To get the freshest eyes, you need to bring players from outside your walls into playtest. Because external players won't know what you're going for, external playtesting often finds problems you wouldn't even think of looking for. Often things we designers just take for granted as working because of a general assumption that they've always worked. Also, don't mistake the fact that playtesting is at the end of this talk for it only making, taking place at the end of the project. Begin testing as early as you can manage and as often as you can afford. The planes of Saints Row 3 showed themselves to be a great example of a problem we didn't even know we had. Because we had already shipped them in Saints Row 2, it would have been easy to just assume that they worked well. But not much gameplay in SR2 revolved around planes, and as such they weren't exactly scrutinized for usability. What changed that was these guys, the F-69 VTOL. These were the signature vehicles of Saints Row 3. They were in pretty much every piece of our PR strategy, so they had to be really good. But they combined all the usability issues of helicopters, threw in the complexity of planes, and added the difficulty of transforming between the two, which meant completely changing the player's control scheme at the press of a button. The demands for usability were immense. And simply put, playtesting results were catastrophic. Players were just crashing left and right. In fact, seemingly to drive this point home, one of our first playtesters to come in was actually a C-130 pilot, and even he couldn't keep one of our birds in the air. And even in the best cases, where players weren't immediately dying once they entered plane mode, they'd only ever be seen flying way up here, hundreds of meters away from danger, straight across the city, and way away from anything interesting. It was just about as boring as flight could be. Initially, we worked on addressing several relatively small surrounding issues. One such issue was that players were very often moving their camera while flying, especially immediately after transforming a VTOL. 
so we made the camera return immediately after player input rather than after a time delay. But that wasn't enough. As you can imagine, this is a pretty dangerous camera angle when you're moving 100 miles an hour. Here's what it looks like just 5 frames later. You're already dead. So we decided to lock the camera completely while in a plane. Now we also dabbled with giving the planes higher maneuverability, but that was a real double-edged sword. It allowed the player to get out of a bad situation quicker, but it also makes for twitchier handling so players could get themselves into trouble all the faster as well. And these and other somewhat minimal fixes did indeed pr improve player success rate, but not nearly enough for the high bar we had to reach. In time we decided to bite the bullet and rebuild the planes from scratch. The core issue was the controls. The player, <clears throat> the plane system we inherited from Saints Row 2 was built like what you might see in a plane simulator. To turn to the right, the player needed to press the thumbstick to the right in order to engage the ailerons and roll right. Then he had to pull back on the stick to engage the elevators to make the craft pull up, which in world space is now to the right. But of course, most players have no idea what ailerons and elevators even are, so this is way too complicated. We replace it with a far more arcadey solution. Want to turn right? Press to the right. Done. The game would take care of all the complicated parts. Now it sounds simple, but this was an extremely difficult and dangerous decision to make. Our time was running out in a big way. There was only one month left until submission lockdown, and we still had a decent list of other improvements we could make instead. Ultimately, we decided that it was worth putting all of our eggs in one basket, sacrificing the rest of our polish list, polish list in order to get just a chance to fix our planes. Thankfully, this calculated risk led to huge payoffs. In the very first playtest that included the new airplane controls, we saw significant gains in how players used planes, VTOLs especially. Moreover, we saw a drastic shift in the flying habits. Instead of flying high above anything of interest, players were becoming more daring, weaving through skyscrapers. We went from this just vomitously boring to this. Now that is pretty much what success looks like. Not all feedback calls for a straightforward response though. Knowing how to use feedback is crucial as how you respond is just as important as the fact that you're asking for feedback to begin with. This can be the most important lesson when working with feedback. Responding incorrectly can not only be unhelpful, but actively lead you away from improvement. Importantly, sometimes this means going directly against what people are asking for. So how do you act on feedback but avoid falling into a trap? Trust your personal observations to draw conclusions rather than following specific requests. This means it's far better to personally observe playtesting than to simply read about the results in a report. Players often don't know what they want and that's often true within your team as well. Look for what the actual underlying problem is before contemplating solutions for it. And, just like when working with our system, it's important to build up an intuition. The more playtesting you watch, the more you'll know what to do. <clears throat> to give a concrete example of this in action, one of the most common requests we had on SR3 was for vehicle cameras that were higher and farther back, allowing the player to see more of the road. But just because something comes up a lot or is popular doesn't make it right or good. As mentioned earlier, having a low close camera 
it is important for the feel of driving and to increase this perception of speed. To raise the camera would be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And as you can see, there's definitely enough of the road visible to act on. So this wasn't really a need so much as a desire that players had. We decided to hold firm and not acquiesce to this particular piece of feedback. But just because we didn't need to raise the cameras didn't mean there wasn't an issue to resolve. Repeatedly in playtests, we would see the following scenario. A player would begin driving a vehicle and attempt to manually move their camera up. Then, either because they were no longer had a good view down the road, or because they were otherwise occupied with the camera, they could almost inevitably crash. And after recovering from the crash, they'd begin driving again, move the camera up again, and then crash again. And they'd do it again, and again, and again. Many players just wouldn't learn from this experience, but we knew that the solution wasn't to change the default camera angle. We decided to suppress the desire to raise the camera instead. And we did this by making the camera's behavior of returning to the default angle more aggressive. Instead of waiting for a delay after manual input, we made it return immediately. Now this went directly against the stated wishes of players, as along with the request to make default cameras higher, we would often get requests for, to make the camera return less aggressively, not more. What we saw from this change was that players would initially still try to move their camera, but then immediately learn that raising the camera was not a good option because it would just return. Then they'd give up trying and then just drive normally. But so what? We coax players against their very wishes. Why is that a victory? Firstly, we saw a large reduction in requests for higher cameras, as players were simply accepting what they were given instead of trying to force it to be something else. More importantly, because they were no longer trying to move their cameras, players were noticeably more successful at driving in general. Finally, this change actually led to higher rated vehicle gameplay. By all accounts, it was extremely successful. Be prepared though, as big changes like this can lead to new feedback from within the team, and it may not be as positive as you'd expect. Teammates may respond differently than playtesters because your team was already used to the old way, whether it was good or bad. So many just see change, and change is scary. Changing our airplane controls and the car follow camera each brought with them a small firestorm from within the team. Each one of these topics generated a sizable thread on the Volition message boards, the gist of which was basically that I was bad at my job, which is pretty fun to hear. This type of backlash is usually about people focusing on something they liked with the old way without seeing the benefits of the new method. Having a solid backing from playtest data can help strengthen your resolve during these times and give you the confidence you need to stick to your guns even if it isn't the popular thing. Be sure to explain to your team why the decision was made and use playtesting data to back up your claims. Chances are you won't be able to persuade everyone, but that's okay. Not everyone has to agree with you, but taking the time to explain yourself shows that you're listening to their concerns, even if you aren't taking the path they prefer. So to wrap things up, take the time to fully understand your system. It'll pay off by allowing you to work faster in the future. Minimize external dependencies so you can continue to work quickly and not have to redo your work. Be sure to have a strong vision before tackling any aspect of your game. Break up your work to not only make it go faster, but produce stronger results. Perception is generally far more important than the reality of a situation, so use that to your advantage. And get feedback on your work both from internal and external sources. But be judicious in your reaction to feedback, as sometimes not doing, uh, doing nothing or going directly against the stated desires is the right move. And that's it for the talk.
I wanted to throw out a thank you to the rest of the Volition Vehicle team, past and present. Without the hard work from our badass programmers and artists, I'd be giving a talk on why our vehicles suck so much. Thanks for watching.